for this open lecture, uh, our guest from United States, uh, Professor uh, Scott Erickson from uh, Catholic College. Um, uh, please welcome also our uh, vice rector, uh, Professor Jana Yusakowska, and uh, who is uh, uh, here uh, a little bit uh, uh, small speech. It's my great pleasure to welcome our guests to Poznan University of Technology and to welcome our colleagues and the students to the lecture of Professor Scott Erickson. Uh, this event, entitled International Days of Competencies for the Future, consists of workshops, lectures, and a conference, and is organized by the Faculty of Engineering Management. But this event would not be so spectacular if not our sponsors. So, uh, Please let me thank our sponsors, Małabę Ostrów-Wielkopolski and Lewicka Fabryka Wyposażenia Wagonu Rawak Lewicza. Bardzo proszę. As you might know, the workshop already started this morning and in a few minutes we will have the pleasure to listen to uh, our first guest speaker, Professor Scott Erickson from Itaca College, uh, where he's Professor of Marketing at the School of Business. The name of the college is well known. Uh, it's also well known that it was established in 1892, uh, which I mention because uh, next uh, October or this October we start celebrating our 100th anniversary. So although a little bit younger, we still feel in this um, club of 100 years old universities. Professor Ericsson has also a broad experience from numerous visits in other prestigious universities, like Cornell University, Queen's University in Canada, or Ballet University. I'm really glad that he happened to visit also Cornell University of Technology, uh, which is quite a large university with almost 20,000 students and uh, 1,200 faculty. It's the second, second largest <coughs> university in Poznan and one of the largest uh, uh, technical universities in Poland. We are organized in 10 faculties. We don't call it schools, just faculties. And each of them grants an engineering title. Although it's a definitely engineering-oriented university, in our research and teaching, we do not neglect social sciences. And here, the Faculty of Engineering Management, as well as the Faculty of Machine Learning and Management, are very active in this field. The currently running project, the Acceleration Method of Development of Transversal Competencies in the Students' Practical Training Process, supported by the Erasmus Plus program, is one of good examples of these activities. Well, but let us come back to our main topic. The field of research of Professor Scott Erickson is related to big data in marketing. His latest book entitled New Methods of Marketing Research and Analytics was published by Edward, Edward Elgar last year. Today, Professor Erickson will speak about organizational learning and knowledge management in an age of big data. <coughs> Professor Erickson, the floor is yours. Sorry. Uh, everyone hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, I'm, I'm happy to see so many so many young people that came to this. Um, and I'm pleased to be here. I, I uh, got in yesterday and saw a little bit of the, the town and the, uh, it's beautiful, especially the, the old square down there. And the campus and this building are beautiful, so I'm, I'm really happy to be here. And. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about big data and knowledge management for a little bit. Um, I do come from Ithaca College. Yeah, it's in New York. doesn't mean New York City. I actually live way upstate, kind of like, you know, Poland isn't just Warsaw. New York is not just New York City. I actually live closer to Toronto than I do New York City. So, um, but Ithaca is a college town, you know, kind of like uh, Poznan. It's uh, several colleges. Cornell's probably the more famous one. Uh, but we're a small liberal arts institution with some professional schools uh, in addition to that, and one of those is the School of Business where I work. Um, and 
What we're going to talk about today, um, I've been working in the field of uh, knowledge management, as we call it, for about 20 years now. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. That's probably going to be a, a different topic for most of you. But things have changed, uh, as, 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 uh, as I'll explain in the last five years or so, suddenly everyone's talking about big data. Everyone's talking about business intelligence. Everyone's talking about business analytics. And that all fits together. Uh, and that, that's kind of what I'm going to try to explain is, is how knowledge and intelligence and data and information, uh, they're all different things, but they all kind of fit into a grander scheme, which really helps us understand how to manage people in companies. All right, so it's going to take a little bit, and at some point you may be wondering why. Why did they invite him to this particular conference? But I can promise you we won't attach it to competencies in, for the future at some point. So there, there is a connection. You know, Just be patient, wait for it. We will make that connection. So that's what we're going to talk about. Um, again, knowledge, knowledge management is a field that's been around since the early 90s. Uh, people have been kind of talking about it. And there are different definitions, but basically it's, it's, it's know-how. Um, you know, as, as, as you're working on a job, you learn how to do things better. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's what's in people's heads about knowing how to do a job. It's, it's experience. It's individual learning. And people who started working in this field um, they started looking and saying, you know, what really differentiates one firm from another, what really makes one firm different than the other firm might be knowledge. You know, it's what's in people's heads, all right? There's, there's a resource-based theory of the firm that says a, a firm has to have something different than it does. It has to have some resource unique to it that no one else has in order to be successful. Otherwise, others could just copy it. Um, so, you know, we used to talk about labor and capital, the economic theory about how much labor do you have, how much capital. Uh, and then things such as nat nat natural resources, information technology. Again, they were used to say, okay, this firm's different and that's why it's successful. But the knowledge-based firm, you know, the firm kind of says, you know, all those, you can pick those up anyway. You can get labor, you can get capital, you can borrow money, you can get IT. What's really different in a firm is its people. That's the one thing that's really unique about the firm and what's in their heads is what makes those people value. All right, so that's kind of where we're coming from. That if you can identify what's in the heads of your employees and manage that more effectively than the other guy, you've got a more successful enterprise. All right, so that, that's kind of the idea. How do we figure out what people know and how do we manage that effectively? So that kind of fits into the theory that came before it. Uh, there's a there's a a scholar named Irving Ackoff is fairly well known in uh, IT and, and, uh, and management circles. And he, was, he, along with some other people, came up with this hierarchy, all right, this pyramid. It says, okay, you got data. If you organize data, it becomes information. If you um, subject information to reflection, where you learn from it, that becomes knowledge. And if you understand, you know, essentially what's behind the knowledge, that becomes wisdom. Um, so, you know, progressively higher levels of understanding, essentially. And again, this is fairly standard theory in, in information technology, but that's where the knowledge idea comes from. All right? It's something more than just data and information. It really is something people have learned, and that's what makes it valuable. <coughs> that's, that's kind of the point. So, okay, if that's the point, we want to know more about this knowledge. All right? So, during the 1990s, uh, Nanaki and Takeuchi published this book, and what it really focused on was explicit knowledge versus tacit knowledge. Um, explicit knowledge is usually, you know, very explainable. You can communicate it. It's very grounded, very down to earth. You can um, codify it into procedures or process documents. Um, Tacit knowledge, on the other hand, is more personal. It's hard to express. It's hard to explain. You don't put it in an IT system. It's hard to codify like that. Um, sort of related, not exactly the same thing, but you know, if you, if you know, research versus develop. All right, research is kind of tacit, and development is kind of explicit. You know, it's it's, it's that kind of distinction, and that becomes important 
because you manage them differently. All right. So again, explicit knowledge, codifiable, explainable, you can capture in information systems, it's shareable. It's things like processes and procedures. You see it in supply chains and firms, you see it in their operations, you see it in their customer relationship management systems. So if anyone's ever uh, done any work in and around the pharmaceutical industry, um, typically when you invent a new drug, you've only started, all right? To make the regulators happy, what you have to do is establish how you're actually going to manufacture that drug. And it's highly regulated, highly controlled. You have to document every single step in the process and follow it every single time you make that drug. And someone's got to sign off that it was actually followed. So heavy documentation in every single step with making a pharmaceutical. That's very explicit, all right, where you really write down and lay out, this is how we do every single step of this process. That's, that's explicit knowledge, all right? Tacit is more personal, all right? Again, it's hard to explain. You, you may understand how to do something, but telling someone else how to do it is difficult, all right? So it's a different kind of knowledge. Again, we don't tend to use IT systems. So this is like non-repetitive operations, all right? Something that's done the same way over and over and over again is explicit. Something where you have to kind of figure out what's wrong and you know, experiment and figure out the solution, that's more tacit. So lots of services are that way. Things like healthcare, where you gotta figure out you know, what the illness is and diagnose and then take action. Uh, innovative processes, how you come up with new ideas. All of that is much more tacit, okay? And the classic example for tacit knowledge is that there was a study of Xerox technicians who fixed copiers. And they found that there was this uh, group of them that would meet every morning and just talk around the water cooler about you know, what they found and what the problem was the previous day. And so they would share these little tips on how to fix copiers. And again, it never got written down any place, it never got documented. It was just water cooler conversation. And again, that's very typical of tacit knowledge. And again, the punchline is that you got different types of knowledge, you manage them differently. All right, you know, again, if one, you can manage one with an IT system, you can, the other one you can't. Obviously, there's very different solutions. But without going into a lot of detail here, essentially, they were saying, you know, tacit to tacit, you need to do individual to individual communication. To pass that along, it needs to be person to person. If you can take tacit and make it more explicit, explain it better, then you might be able to distribute it to a group. All right, so the, the more explicit it is, you can essentially transfer it more easily. And then you might be able to combine that and discover new things. As individuals come into a firm, they learn about the organizational culture and things like that and make it tacit. There's just all sorts of uh, variations that we don't really have time to get into. But the point is, again, if you understand what kind of knowledge you have, you can manage it better, all right? And again, if you've got a lot of tacit knowledge, you don't want to invest in a big IT system. That's not the right solution. If you've got a lot of explicit knowledge, just doing it person to person, you're losing out. You need to scale that up. All right, you need to make it more efficient to get to lots and lots of people. So again, without getting into the details, the point is just different types of knowledge exist, and you manage them differently. You know, that's the, the main point. So explicit knowledge, again, we have IT systems. There were some really big installations in the early 2000s, you know, tens of millions of dollars, <coughs> customized solutions uh, that often didn't do real well. So, in a way, enthusiasm for knowledge management systems kind of dimmed. But we did learn a lot of lessons, so people are still installing things. Um, IBM Notes, um, SharePoint from uh, Microsoft, um, SAP has a solution. You know, it, it's all put these big IT systems to hold and transfer knowledge. All right. you know, again, that's, that's how we kind of manage that. And again, there's a lot of theory around it for these to work. And the reason we had a lot of failures in the early 2000s was mainly because they weren't designed well. But it's kind of modeled as a, as a market, all right? And I don't know if a lot of you have had basic economics, but you know, a market presumes supply and demand. 
So from a supply standpoint, you have to have people contributing knowledge. So as I learn something about my job, I'm supposed to report that into the system. All right? um, if that doesn't happen enough, the supply side breaks down and you've got problems. That was one of the big mistakes in the early 2000s. You didn't motivate people to contribute. On the demand side, people have to use the knowledge. They have to go into the system and find helpful knowledge that they're going to use in their jobs. Again, if they can't find anything useful, they don't use it, the system breaks down. All right? So you have to have people putting in useful knowledge, you have to have people pulling out useful knowledge for this to really operate. And again, without incentives and motivation and some other things, it, it just kind of breaks down. But that's the way it's supposed to work. And there are, there are companies that, that do it well. Tacit knowledge is more person to person. All right, again, this is highly personalized. You have to explain to other people about what it's about. Um, so again, it could just be one person training another. Apprenticeships, mentoring, those are tacit to tacit systems. Um, we have something called communities of practice where people get together and talk. They're kind of like the uh, water cooler Xerox technicians, but more formalized. There's storytelling. The idea that sometimes tacit knowledge is so hard to explain, you can't do it directly. You have to tell stories. All right. So, um, and again, that, that's that's uh, something companies commonly do: case histories, uh, post mortems on projects. That's kind of storytelling, you know, keeping a, a record of what happened. So again, we do have systems for managing this, but it's radically different from the IT systems for explicit doesn't say you only have the two extremes. Most companies have both, or there's knowledge that's kind of both explicit and tacit. So you need to be able to recognize what kind of knowledge you have and manage it effectively. Pick the right kind of system. So one company that does that is Intel. All right? Intel has a program that's called Copy Exactly. And what Copy Exactly does is it, they determine what the best practices are in their fabrication plants, and whenever they build a new plant, they copy it exactly. All right, and you can kind of see this in some of this. You know, they make sure the equipment is exactly the same, same model. All right, you know, exactly the same as in any other plant. They make sure that the uh, chemicals they use are from the same supplier. They make sure that anything they do with the process is copied exactly. Now, some of that is documented. It's very explicit knowledge. You know, again, what kind of machine did you have? It? What should your run rate be? Its efficiency, all that stuff is documented. That's very explicit. But then when they open the plant, they actually bring in teams from other plants to train the new employees. So there's also a tacit to tacit exchange on how do you actually run the machine most efficiently. How do you actually, you know, turn this knob and turn that knob and make it better? What sort of problems do you have that you need to solve? All right. So they actually do both. And again, the idea is to, they, they've identified their best practices, be they explicit or tacit, and they make sure to copy it and copy it and copy it. All right. you know, so that sharing takes place. All right. So that's essentially how it's done. Again, this only works when there's an exchange. As I mentioned, uh, people have to contribute to the system, so we model this as an exchange. So party one has to contribute their knowledge, and they have to get something back. All right, so I'm the most efficient employee on the assembly line. I know how to do my job better than anyone else. Why should I share that? You know, what, what's in it for me? Who's to say you're not gonna take my knowledge uh, make a process document and then ship my job off somewhere else, offshore. You know, why, why should I? Why should I contribute my personal knowledge? Well, that's just it. You have to make it worth their while. All right, you got to figure out a reason why they should share. So the culture of the organization is extremely important. What we call the social capital is it a cohesive organization. Is there a lot of trust? All of that needs to be in place. Right? So, you know, again, this, this, this really needs to work. So there have to be incentives, there have to be motivation. And the bottom line is finally that people matter. All right, you know, it's, if people are the most important resource of the organization, and what's in their heads is the key to that, 
any system you design and better treat them right. All right, you know, even if it's an IT system, if the people aren't willing to use it, it doesn't matter. All right, so the whole idea is that, that people are the key to organizational success. And uh, again, this, this isn't a real uh, organizational behavior type discipline, but it's still the bottom line that the people really matter. Okay, so knowledge, again, is know-how, job-related skill, competences, again, uh, would be a good description of it. And it's explicit and tacit. But if you remember that pyramid, all right, you know, with information and data below knowledge, suddenly we're in the big data here. So where does big data fit in with all of this, right? Um, 20 years ago, the people in knowledge management would have said, data, eh, it doesn't matter. All right? Until it becomes knowledge, it's not valuable. It's just a, data is a precursor. It has no value in and of itself, except that it might become knowledge. That's changed. All right? you know, big data is valuable. Um, you know, if you follow the business press at all, you know that if all of you are doing engineering, I'm sure you know it. Um, so we need to rethink it. Okay. And so instead of knowledge, we started talking about intangible assets. Kind of widen the field. Okay, there's knowledge and there's other stuff too. Maybe it isn't just knowledge. And you can kind of think about it in order, and we'll explain why this order in a minute, but there's big data, explicit knowledge, tacit knowledge, and then business analytics and intelligence, which tends to come from big data, is actually something different. All right, and again, I'll explain why as we go along. But there's a wider range, all right? And again, business is investing in all of these now, all right? You know, it's still doing the knowledge stuff, but it's also looking at big data and analytics. So instead of the former pyramid, I would say it looks something more like this, all right? Where you've got a base with data and information, and if you learn something from that, it becomes explicit, and at a higher level, it's tacit, and at an even higher level, you have this intelligence. Insights. And again, we'll talk about each of those. So, where this kind of came from, um, Dave Snowden is, is really well known in the knowledge management field. He worked for IBM for years. I think he still does. I think his consultancy is still a little bit of part of IBM. Um, he was one of the major people. I, I mentioned storytelling. He's really well known for storytelling and you get ideas from subconscious, uh, you know, things you can't even explain. But in 2003, he introduced this, all right, which is the Sinophon domain. It's actually incredibly complicated, all right? It's hard to read, it's hard to make sense of. But, and, and I'm not gonna take you through all the details here, but essentially it kind of goes from bottom right up and around, where there's things that we know, and they're very, structured, you go up a little bit and it's knowable, it's still semi-structured but not quite as much, go over to complex and now things are starting to get unstructured, it's harder to make sense of, to an environment that he calls chaos where it's just a mess, all right, if you're going to make sense of this environment it really takes something, some kind of insight. So it kind of goes in a circle which as we'll see, this is the same thing, but Albert Simar from Canada kind of reconfigured it. And the thing to pay attention to, let's see if I got my. All right, so this, this really structured part, there's your data. All right, so this is just passing data all around. Again, very structured, can be automated. This is more explicit knowledge. Again, it's not a structure, it's just basic data, but it's still, you know, there's some mathematical certainty to it. Again, it can go in IT systems, it's digital. Again, it gets a little bit more unstructured. There's some uncertainties, there's your tacit knowledge. And then again, when everything just totally breaks down, that's when you need, you know, people with real intuition to make sense of things. So this you can manage just with data, you know, and, and, and data systems. And you need to have increasing levels of learning and understanding as you kind of go around. All 
All right, so again, just kind of, um, so a data system, you've got the center here, and then you've got points around the center. With data systems, everything flows to the center. All right, so um, operational data, supply chain data, transactions, customer data, everything flies to the center. Again, it's just data, easy to collect, and so it goes to the center. With explicit knowledge, you try and send it to the center, but it's also possible to share things around the perimeter, like Intel does. You know, again, Intel Central has all the data, but the plants share things with each other as well. It doesn't have to flow to the center to be effective. Tacit, because it needs to be shared person to person, it never goes to the center. All right, you know, again, it has to be more of a person to person around the outside. And chaos intelligence is so personal it doesn't get shared at all. All right, again, you can't even explain to other people how to do this. It's, it's too, too personal, too unique to you. So, again, you've got data flying around, you've got explicit knowledge and IT systems helping, and then it gets more personal and even so personal that you can't even share it. Okay, so if you start thinking in those terms, again, it kind of makes sense. And again, you get this range from big data, which is just sharing data around, explicit knowledge, which is data <coughs> perspective, tacit, which is very personal, and then again, analytics intelligence, which again, is so personal, it's really hard to explain to other people. It's almost impossible to share. Okay, so it's getting extremely structured to extremely unstructured, distributable to the entire network down to where it's only yours, all right? You know, it's so personal, it's only yours. So again, you need to kind of manage them differently, okay? So again, short explanation, what is big data? Again, it typically comes from places in the value chain, uh, things that, that generate a lot of data are the supply chain, you know, are, are all your inputs arriving where they're supposed to be in the right amounts, where they're being used. Your operations usually kick up a lot of data. Your distribution systems kick up a lot of data. Customer transactions kick up a lot of data. Any customer contacts, there's, there's a tremendous amount of data, again, especially if you can identify the customers like an Amazon or a Facebook can. Um, social media generates a lot of uh, data, all right? So there's all sorts of parts of a business that generate just a lot of data. Okay, and that's nothing new. Uh, you know, ERP systems, enterprise resource planning systems about how the organization's running would feed into a data warehouse. Again, all the customer relationship we go into the data warehouse, legacy systems like your accounting systems, some third-party apps. And we all go in, and again, they're reported out. Um, all those are very structured, though. Again, it's it's uh, you know, um, it's all quantitative. However, what's really different about big data, and we typically define it as the three Ds. Um, data volume is increasing incredibly fast. And how much data an organization generates again, from its supply chain, from its operations, from its transactions is growing exponentially. <clears throat> Huge amounts of data are being uh, delivered every day. The velocity is much faster. All right, so how we process and report the data. Instead of reporting on a quarterly basis or a monthly basis or a weekly basis or even a daily basis, the data can be reported in real time. All right, so what's going on with your cash registers? There are organizations that can tell you down to the second. All right, there you go. Amazon can report things immediately. So data velocity has gone up. All right, we get real time data. We get the data immediately if we want it. And data variety has increased. So again, where it used to be just quantitative, now you've got text, you've got uh, you know, photos and images, you've got video, all of that can be taken in and stored on information systems. And it is, as all of you know, that takes up a tremendous amount of storage. Right? Anything unstructured like that, a lot of storage. So when we say big data, that's what we mean, all right. 
really high volume, really fast, and all sorts of things that we can use. So again, coming back to this, now you got all this other stuff feeding in too, and again, all of these we didn't used to be able to store on IT systems. You know, again, the only thing we could put in an IT system was spreadsheet type stuff. You know, now we can digitize all this. And it takes special processes, and I'm not a computer guy, or you know, I, I don't know how to set this up. But there are people who do, and again, we can report all of that in real time. Okay? So Quick example, for, uh, you know, Caesars. All right, Caesars is a big uh, casino and entertainment company in the U.S. Um, they identify all their customers with a loyalty card. All right, so if you're in the Caesars, they know it. Okay, uh, they monitor lines. All right, so one of the things they do is they monitor waiting times to check in. They monitor what people are doing in the casino, get waiting lines, things like that. So. They can actually take care of that. You know, they, they can monitor the video and they can spot when something is wrong, when the line is getting too long, and immediately do something about it. Right? They can monitor one of their you know, best paying guests, you know, someone who, who spends a lot of money with Caesars. If they have a bad night at the casino, they can meet them at the door with the check and say, bad, you know, too bad, bad luck, try us again next time. All right? So they can gather all that data and really different types of data, report it immediately, and react immediately. Right, so, and that's big data. All right, again, it's not just the size, but it's how fast and the variety of data that you can, you can process as well. All right, and again, I'm not a, I'm not a uh, computer programmer who sets these things up, but there's you know, complex uh, matrices that you set up to, to make the data base Workable. A lot of you probably know more about this than I do, but the main point, you know, there, there's people who do that. All right, you don't have to be able to do that in order to use big data. Right? Behind the scenes, there are computer programmers who set this stuff up. But as far as competences, you just need to be able to read what the big data is and right? understand it. And that's essentially what's done. All right, big data all by itself. There's not really any analysis. All right, again, it's gathering it and reporting it. So this is from uh, Google Analytics, all right, which you, you may or may not uh, know much about. You can get certified online. It's actually pretty easy. But again, it just reports website performance um, for, for anyone who signs up to it. You know, again, on a, you know, it's pretty much on a daily basis. You can get it more uh, you know, quicker than that. But all it does is report, all right? So, how many people are visiting the site, you know, how many sessions, how many users, how many page views, how many, uh, there's a bounce rate here somewhere, the bounce rate is people who leave after the first page. Uh, again, they just report that in real time, okay? And that's very typical of, of big data, where you just monitor. All you're doing is watching it. And you'll often have a dashboard like this. And there are key performance indicators. Again, you know, why do we care about bounce rate? Well, that's important. People don't get past the first page. That's a problem. You never see the rest of your website. This is where algorithms come in. Again, you can program in and say if a key performance indicator hits 75%, we react. All right, you can plug that in there, you know, some kind of uh, action point. And this is where artificial intelligence can kind of get it. You know, artificial intelligence can try solutions like, okay, it hits 75%, we're going to react in this way, the machine learns from that and does the same thing or does something different next time. Right. So big data is where you kind of get all of this working together. But again, we're not analyzing it. We're just reporting, all right? It's just collected, reported, collected, reported. That's all it is. Which doesn't take any real knowledge, wisdom, intelligence, all those other words we've been talking about. Okay. Another company that does this a lot is Spotify. All right. um, you know, Spotify, if you think about everything they know about you, they know your background when you register, they know where you listen to music, they know what your listening preferences are, they know your listening habits, so if you listen to different types of music at different types of day, they know that. They know the connections that you make as far as your playlists that you create. If you attach it to social media, they know some of your social media stuff. A lot of people sign in through Facebook or you know, 
tell friends on Facebook. They can watch other IMC, Integrated Marketing Communications. So for example, if uh, an artist appears on a talk show, they can monitor and see if that changes streams of the, uh, of the data. They can do context, what you listen to and when. One thing a lot of people don't know about Spotify and something that makes it really valuable to artists is that they have a lot of data they can give back to the artist. All right, so the old days, when I buy a CD, all right, they knew I bought it, they might know where I bought it, and that's about it. Okay. They don't know when I listen to it, how much I listen to it, how many times I play each track, they, they know none of that. Now they do. All right. So they can actually tell the artist which of their high passion fans have listened to the CD, what tracks they like, where they listen to it, what time they listen to it. They do things like track blips. There's a, there's a famous pattern in the data where they follow Friday and Saturday nights and after parties. All right, and they can see, you know, okay, what's going to be played at the after parties you know, in the big cities? So that's how they kind of spot upcoming artists and you know newer artists that are, are really catching on. They can get all of that. All right. But all of that is just monitoring the data. All right, that's just watching the data come by, and again, they aren't analyzing it in any way. All right, and again, this is just the kind of thing where they follow over time and they can see how the streams react to different events. All right, so, but again, it's just reporting. You monitor the data, you watch it go by, you might react to it, but you're not analyzing it. You're just watching it. All right? It's very typical of big data. That, that's all it is. Okay, um, Amazon does much the same thing. This is just a comparison of their pricing changes. And these are not random. You can bet Amazon has been tweaking prices, experimenting. What if we drop the price here? What if we raise the price there? What did our competitors do? And again, this is optimizing their pricing path based on all the data they've seen gone by. And again, they just watch that and adjust. Okay, Amazon uh, in the U.S., the National Football League, uh, you know, U.S. football, big sport in the U.S. Um, Amazon actually signed a deal to stream National Football League games this past fall. Uh, now, obviously, they're not a television station. They're not a content company, necessarily. They, they sort of are. But, um, so the question is, okay, what, what's about that? Um, really terrified a number of competitors, right? Because what uh, what the cable networks know about you is what you watch. Uh, they, they can tell whether you're watching football or not, whether you change the channel. Um, but Amazon actually has capabilities a closer to Netflix, all right. And if, I Netflix in Europe? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, Netflix not only knows what you watch, but it knows, you know, whether you're binging on it, and it knows uh, whether you're, you're uh, you know, surfing away for a while. It, you know, it knows all sorts of things the cable company does. So Amazon, because it's streaming, is going to know all of that. Plus, to stream on Amazon, you need to sign in. So now Amazon can pair that data from your streaming behavior with everything else it already knows about you. Right? No one else has that. All right, so it can say, you know, John Jones, we know all this about him. By the way, this is the way he watches football. Right? That is so attractive to advertisers. All right, I mean, they, they can personalize it down to the individual, individual uh, account. All right, and again, that's scary to the cable company because they, they do not have that kind of capability. But again, that's just monitoring the data. You haven't really analyzed it at all yet. That's just watching the data go by and say, okay, we understand you know, John Jones. We, we know what to do with it. Okay, so that's big data. 
All right, now, we often use big data interchangeably with business analytics, business intelligence, marketing analytics, my field, marketing intelligence. So, okay, what's that? All right, because obviously I'm separating. That's where you start analyzing. All right, so big data, we're just watching it go by. Now, analytics and intelligence, we're going to analyze it. So we're, we're going to take this big data that we have, and we're actually going to do some... Um, Look at it more and more clearly, mathematical methods. So the famous story of this is Target. Um, it's, it's kind of an urban legend, but it's actually true. Um, there was a father who stormed into Target and infuriated that they were sending his 16-year-old daughter uh, special offers about things she would use because she was pregnant. Um, so yeah, he's furious with them. He didn't know she was pregnant. I'm not, she knew she was pregnant, but he didn't know at that time. So Target actually knew before her father that she was pregnant. Right? Turned out she was. How did they know that? Well, in marketing, um, one of the things that we look at are major life events. You know, when someone has a major life event, their behavior changes. And if you can hook them when their behavior changes, often you've got a customer for you know quite some time. So we always look for behavior changes. And Target actually... Um, identified this as an opportunity. If we could figure out when someone's pregnant and we could get them as a customer early, we can probably hang on to them. All right? you know, through the pregnancy, through the kids, you know, when the kids are young, we can probably keep them as a target customer. So they actually put their data analyst on that. They said, okay, you find some variables that are going to predict whether people, you know, whether women are pregnant or not. Okay? And they won't reveal what it was, but he actually came up with it. He found a bunch of variables that, uh, as it says in the example there, gave a 87% uh, chance that that individual was pregnant. All right? And again, things you might not necessarily associate. Diaper bags, zinc and magnesium, supplements, bright blue rug, big purse. All right. And again, he could find the correlation with those variables and be pregnant. Okay? That's analysis, sorry. That's the analytics part. That's what you need a, a high-level statistician to do. You're not just watching the data, you're looking for deeper insight into the data. And that's what business analytics or business intelligence is about. Okay, so Spotify does this too. Spotify doesn't just monitor data, it actually mines the data. So again, if you've got Spotify, you know they send out Discover Weekly. Okay? So every week, they make up a personalized playlist for you and say, hey, you might be interested in this stuff. All right, we haven't seen you really listen to these artists, but you might be interested in this. Now, where does that come from? It's a technique called clustering. Okay? And what they do is, you know, the simple version of it is, if you listen to artists A, B, and C, they look in their database and they find a segment of people who listen to artists A, B, C, and D. So they're a lot like you, all right? They group you with them. But you don't listen to artist D yet. These other people who are like you do like artist D. And they make a recommendation to say, hey, you probably would like artist D as well. So they just cluster like group, you know, people together or like objects together in a group. And then you can make this recommendation or right? predictive analysis. All right? So they can actually go into their database and, and do that sort of thing. And again, it's very complex, and I'm not an IT guy, so um, you know, I don't do this. But you can just see they, you know, they, they watch what people listen to, and they look at the playlist they put together, and the artist page they go together, and what radio stations they like to listen to. They'll get outside information. So for example, if uh, Wikipedia says such and such was a, an influence on this artist, they'll log that away. And again, then they'll, you know, they, they, they use, uh, again, Hadoop for the unstructured data, but they put it all together and they cluster people and bang, out comes your Discover Weekly recommendation, you know, based on all of this, all of this data, all right? But again, what I want you to see is the difference, all right? You know, big data, all by itself, we just watch it. Analytics, 
we actually subject it to some kind of statistical analysis. All right? And that's where, when you hear about PhD statisticians doing work on Wall Street, or you know, this is what they do. Right? You know, this is the kind of analysis that they're looking at. Pandora, which is Spotify's big competitor, does much the same thing. It makes recommendations, but it's a totally different method statistically. They actually do something more like regression. All right, which again, I don't know how many of you have gotten to that in statistics course, but they've actually identified a whole bunch of variables, and they have trained musicologists so that every new song that comes in, they listen to it, and they say which of the 450 variables it has. All right, so it might have you know heavy bass or distorted guitar or female vocalist. You know, they've got a whole bunch of variables. And again, they can use that to predict what you like. All right, so they say, okay, you listen to this, 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 and this. It has these 10 variables in it that are associated to what you like. There's a correlation there. Any new song that comes in that has those 10 variables, you're probably going to like that too. All right, so it gets to the same point as Spotify, but it's a totally different method of analysis. All right, so again, you did this kind of stuff, and, and you know time doesn't really allow getting into it, but again, it's, it's higher level statistics, and you're looking for really unexpected insights that just kind of observing the data wouldn't give you. you know, things that really correlate or cluster together. Okay, to do all of that, and we're coming to the punchline, all right? Remember I told you there would be a punchline, we're coming to the punchline. Um, so data and information, again, you tend to just, you know, it's just streamed, all right? Explicit knowledge, tacit knowledge, you use the right knowledge management system. All right? Again, explicit knowledge, we tend to use some kind of IT system, so we spread it easily. Tacit knowledge, we use person-to-person -person communication. Intelligence, getting insights using analytics, you really need some kind of analysis all right and you know eventually that gets you to a point where you can take action you know, analyze you come up with some unexpected insight and we constructed this graphic talking about uh, competitive intelligence all right so that's that's I, I pulled this out of a uh, paper that we did um, where you do actually have a team that sits down and looks at all the uh, you know the data and the knowledge and, the insights, and comes up with you know some idea of what you're competitors going to do, um, but the point is that you really need to take everything that you know and analyze it to actually come up with intelligence. It's a much different process, essentially. It needs to be managed much differently. Okay, so a couple people in the room know my collaborator um, who um, usually I present with. This is the point where she would say, so what? All right, you know, we just spent, you know, what, 45 minutes talking about all this, so what? What's, what's the point? Um, she's actually, she just got back from a yoga retreat in Costa Rica, so that's why um, she's not here with me. Well, again, I think that the important part is that there are these different types of intangibles, all right? Now again, we started talking about the two types of knowledge, and those are important. But now we have data, and now we have intelligence as well. All right, and we've got modern companies using all of them successfully. Big data is pretty much, you know, if you're doing data and information, it's pretty much all big data. There might be a little intelligence, but you know, big data kind of contributes. You might find insights throughout. Knowledge management, we tend to apply to these and make sure it happens. Intelligence, you use all of these as inputs, but again, you've got to have some kind of analysis to really come up with the unique insights. All right, again, we could talk about this in another setting for quite some time, but that's, that's not the point because I want to get here. Again, we've got the four types of intangibles we laid out, and if you follow this, you know it goes from very structured to very unstructured. Right, so. You know, very quantitative, digital, easily captured with digital, to, you know, so highly personal you can't even explain it. And it goes from systems that can 
spread it across the entire, not just the entire organization, this entire network, you know, all its suppliers, all of its vendors, you know, big data goes outside the organization to where, okay, you can probably spread it throughout a group to you spread it person to person to, it might just be you. You might not be able to share it at all. All right, so they've got different tendencies. So again, entire network throughout the company within a group and probably just the individual. So they've all had different tendencies, and obviously you need to you need to manage them differently. So what does that mean as far as the competencies you need? You know, if you are in an organization, you're saying, okay, what kind of people do we need? What do we need to do to manage these intangibles effectively? Well, first you need to understand which intangibles you have. Again, some companies have big data and not much else. Other companies have a lot of tacit knowledge. Some might have both explicit and tacit. But you have to understand what you have so that you kind of get people with the right competencies. So for data and information, you do need a programmer, you do need a data scientist, but as I always tell my students, you're the consumer of the data. You need, don't need to do that yourself. All right? You know, as a marketing student, you don't need to be the programmer, you don't need to be the data scientist. You just need to understand what they give you. So, okay, the user of the data they need to understand the content enough to know what to monitor, how to act, you know, if, if something goes out of tolerance, what do you do? Maybe enough to install algorithms. Again, when you hit 75%, do this. They need to understand the situations well enough to do that. This is also where artificial intelligence is getting into machine learning, which means these are the types of situations where you actually might see the humans getting replaced. Uh, you know, again, this, this is where machines can learn to act. And they can try different things, they can experiment, they can find out what works and what doesn't work. So, you know, again, big data is just monitoring it and you do need people who understand what that is, but there's a limit to what you actually need in terms of competency. Explicit knowledge Again, it's IT oriented, you need someone to set up that system, though uh, again, they're, they're, they're kind of off the shelf stuff that works these days as well. But you need people who are able to learn. You know, again, explicit knowledge is something someone has learned that they're now sharing with others. So there needs to be people able to learn on their own. They need to contribute that knowledge. If they find knowledge in the knowledge bank, they need to be able to use that knowledge effectively. All right, and our, uh, our hosts, one of the things they talked about in the lead up to this conference, uh, they, they published a, uh, well, I don't know, I'd call it a book, because it's 200 pages, but uh, I, I, you know, it's uh, talking about transversal competencies. Um, this is where entrepreneurship would be important. You know, the, the ability to learn on your own, to want to do a better job, to try and learn to do things better. All right, so, so they, they kind of coined the term transversal competences in that book. This is where at least entrepreneurship would start to appear. Tacit knowledge, again, that's more, more person to person contact. So you need to be able to talk to other people, you need to work with other people. Here you just need to you know, get along with the IT system. Here you, not, you need to be actually able to uh, cooperate as a group. Right. You need to share stuff, you need to be open to having other people share with you. So again, you learn, and then you contribute knowledge. You share it with others, you know, often in group settings or person to person, and you need to be able, again, to apply that knowledge. But again, where this is just going into the IT system, this is cooperating, all right? talking to others, forming groups, talking about things that you learned and sharing that. So again, getting into the transversal competences, you start to get into communicativeness and teamwork. All right, those get important as well. All right, so again, you, you don't just need to be a marketer, you need to have some of these other capabilities in order to be an effective marketer in a tacit knowledge environment. And finally, intelligence, again, you need the programmer and the data scientist, someone needs to set up the system like Spotify has to learn things from the, uh, from the data. Um, the content, again, Person-to-person -person learning, contribute knowledge, apply knowledge. You know, at some point, 
again, you, you might have a learning team which is trying to analyze the data and trying to figure out something from that. Person A may not be able to explain exactly what they do to person B, but at least they're trying to learn together in their own individual way. So, again, you need people who are willing to take on a sense of entrepreneurship. They need to communicate with each other. There needs to be teamwork. And they need to be creative. Types. All right, again, this is where creativity, where the unexpected happens, where you find things other people would not have anticipated, but you're creative in looking at the data so you think see things that other people don't. What if we try these variables? You know, it's a, you need to think outside the box, essentially. So, again, I think this is where, again, the threat is most for artificial intelligence replacing jobs. The more you get down this line, and as these softer skills get to be more and more important, that's where the people are important. All right, you know, again, it's the personal characteristics that really get to be important. So the systems are there, but what kind of person is right for the system? You need people with more and more of these these softer skills, again, the transversal competencies. So we call that intangible dynamics. Again, just the, the, the main idea is that different intangibles require different systems. All right, you know, what, what, what works for big data doesn't work for explicit knowledge, and that doesn't work for tacit knowledge. Okay. You might have all of those, you might need systems for all of those, but whatever you have, you need a system for it. Different systems with different management. You know, how you manage a tacit exchange is different from how you manage big data. And you need different competences to be effective in each of those scenarios. And again, you might have one of the intangibles, you might have all four of the intangibles, but you need to understand what your intangible structure looks like in your organization because the intangibles required to compete vary by industry sector. Okay? And this is where we've done most of our research. So I, I could actually talk about this all day as far as what each industry sector looks like. But different industry sectors require different types of intangibles to be successful. Right? Something like pharmaceuticals, something like uh, you know, semiconductors like Intel, you need all four of them. All right, you know, it's just a, you, you need big data to create data. All right, you, you need all four of them. Others, you might just need one. It, it just really depends. Right. So strategic management of intangibles requires the right systems, the right management, and the right competences in your workforce for your given circumstances. You need to understand all of that to effectively put in the right system. All right, so again, we, we've studied this. Um, up here is where you, you, where you have high intelligence, you have high knowledge by our metrics. You, you need all four. You need big data, you need explicit data, you need tacit, you need, you need, you need all four. So again, pharmaceuticals, semiconductors, um, a, a company like Google, someone in software, uh, you, you need all four. Down here, these types of companies, they're often regulated. They may have big data, but they don't really have much in the way of required knowledge or new intelligence, all right? It's good. They're, they're so heavily regulated, they're so mature, there's just not much new happening under the sun. They need to keep their systems under control, and that's what big data does, but they don't, they don't need anything else, all right? And again, they don't need highly skilled people, necessarily, because they, they just don't have that. Um, out here where knowledge is high, but intelligence is low, that's probably a lot of explicit knowledge, right? That's what's important in these industries. What we see here, are companies with uh, you know that, that need really strong logistical capabilities, so they need to be really efficient in terms of supply chains and operations, or and or companies with really strong brands, so they need really effective customer relationships. They need to manage those effectively. Both of those are explicit knowledge circumstances. All right, where, where you find best practices, you find what works. And again, you can then leverage that at scale, right? But not necessarily a whole lot of creativity. You know, you know, I, I know P&G come proper gamble for those of you who don't know. They do come out with new products occasionally, but not not like you know a pharmaceutical company does. 
Up here is a really interesting one where you have high intelligence and not much knowledge, which seems really strange. And I can tell you that this is very characteristic of financial services, and they have huge amounts of data. Uh, you know, financial services probably are you know, the biggest of big data users. So they got a lot of data, they've got intelligence metrics very high, but they don't seem to use any knowledge, which again seems really strange. But what we think is going on is that they have the data and every once in a while they come up with some nugget, you know, something new that they spot in the data. But it's nothing that they really share as far as best practices, it's some insight. They can apply it, they can put it in a new product, but it's not going to help them finding another new product or somewhere in the, in the process. All right. Um, and the re one of the reasons that we know intelligence is high is competitive intelligence is really, really high in, in financial services. As soon as someone comes up with something new, everyone else wants it. So I find a new portfolio strategy, an investment strategy, everyone else wants to copy it. So intelligence is really high. But again, it's, it's just that little bit of insight that separates these companies, and that's really hard to duplicate the way that we do with, with a lot of knowledge. All right. So again, the main point, and we could go into a lot of detail on this that there's just not time for. Again, we know industries vary. All right? We know that an industry sector has certain requirements for intangibles. All right, you know, if you're if you're in pharma or software, you need them all. Right? If you're in uh, you know, Southern Company, for those of you who don't, it's an electrical utility. Right? Not nothing interesting there. Um, so it varies by industry. All right, and. I want to leave time for questions, so I'm going to actually skip over healthcare. Then. Ah, I'm going to skip over healthcare. Um, come back tomorrow, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. Okay, so to wind it up. Um, again, we talked about knowledge, all right, which again has a scholarly history of you know, 25 years now, so it's, it's nice to base our thinking on. But with big data and business intelligence, we've kind of got new, two new intangibles to worry about. All right? Again, they're different. So if we, if we understand those different intangibles, again, the idea of intangible dynamics is the intangibles differ predictably. We need to understand which intangibles are important for us in our industry that we're operating. The strategies for managing the intangibles differ. Okay, so what you do, again, do you put in an IT system for explicit knowledge management? Do you put in a big data system? Do you put in an analytics capability? What do you do? The competences differ. All right, so what you need in each situation, who you hire and what you expect them to be able to do is going to differ depending on your industry sector and what those intangible requirements are. And then at the end of the day, the people do matter because of all of that, the people that you have and what they're able to do, how you motivate them to do it, how you incentivize them to do it, you know, it, it really matters. You know, the intangibles are all about what's in people's heads. In cases of big data, companies can capture some of that. Um, in other cases, it's so personal that, that we have what we call star employees. That boy, boy, you better not make them mad because if they leave, you're in big trouble. Um, you know, so it, it runs the gamut. But if you understand that, you should be able to be more competitive within your segment. You should have the right intangibles in the right place and be managing them effectively. And again, I think that ties in very well to the competences to the future, especially those transversal competences that uh, our hosts have written about. Um, you know, I, I think they're, they're right on the money with what's going to be important for the future. Again, those softer skills really fit in what we know about what people are going to need to operate in the, uh, that intangibles environment. So strategy is the key. Understanding the environment and acting appropriately is the key. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's about it. This is the book, if anyone's interested in how this applies to marketing. Uh, this is uh, what I use in my classes to talk about uh, monitoring data versus uh, actually analyzing data. So um, 
if anyone's interested, I'm happy to ask questions about that. But thank you, and we should have time for questions. One question related to the political market. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of publications uh, for, uh, which uh, for analyzed applications of big data analysis and knowledge, man and knowledge management during, uh, let's say, US uh, presidential elections and during uh, Brexit, Brexit related elections. Would you make any comments? Um, yeah. Data was flawed. Um, I, I think in both of those cases, there were concerns about whether they were giving a representative uh, group of people to respond that people might be embarrassed to tell the truth or the pollsters were reaching them. One, one key thing about big data, uh, especially as corporations use it, it's not sampling in most cases. Instead of sampling a small part of the population, you're measuring the entire population. So that isn't a problem in a lot of big data applications. Um, but whenever, whenever you sample, if, you know, if it's flawed, you, know, you, you can end up with a lot of questions. Yeah. 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 The question in your presentation was uh, really interesting. Uh, but do you think that uh, can we stop it? Uh, I'm thinking because it's going uh, in the direction of a big brother, yes, uh, like like show, yes, that uh, for example we are buying uh, something for the internet, yes, and actually everybody knows, yes, I'm thinking about some uh, uh, some big uh, enterprise. What are our needs, and they give, give us uh, some proposal, yes? Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that uh, uh, can we stop it? And where is uh, the barrier? Yes. Um, it's scary. It, 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 it's really scary. All right. If, if you read about this and you understand what some of these companies know about each of us individually, it's very scary. Right? Amazon, Facebook, um, even even Spotify. So you know, what what they know about us is is incredible. All right. Um, and they not only know about us, but they are able to experiment and experiment in, in marketing, at least, is something that we've been doing for a very long time. But we haven't been able to experiment on individuals. So I, I mentioned Caesars, where maybe someone's been coming to a casino once a month for five years and they don't show up for three months. They'll experiment. How do we get them back in the casino? Let's send them this. What happened? Let's send them this. What happened? So they actually know for that individual what works. So again, that's really scary. Um, <coughs> Europe is actually farther ahead of, of, the, of the US in terms of privacy and, and what can be done with data. So, you know, data is valuable. I think the, there's growing belief that that data <coughs> should belong to the individual. And if you want me to give you my data, you better cut me a good deal to use it. And I, I think, I think that's where we need to go is people need to be more aware of what the data is that they're gathering and more control over it. Because uh, right now at least, you know, if you download an app and you click OK to the terms, you're giving them freedom to do whatever they want to with the app. I think it needs to be much more transparent. People need to understand what it is and Again, take more ownership of that valuable data because I, I, I think it's worth enough to companies that they'll change if the pressure is put on them. Thank you very much for a yeah. very exciting lecture. Thank you. Um, uh, maybe I can make a little addition mm -hmm. uh, because inspired basically by your words. And that relates to an area which uh, seems to be uh, uh, in the forefront in the future <coughs> of uh, big data, uh, which is called uh, neuroscience. Uh, as you uh, completely correctly uh, associated uh, big data with uh, wisdom mm -hmm. and with intelligence. Mm -hmm. So neuroscience is uh, easily to be understand, understood uh, close to those, and it relates to, me to medicine. I mean, the early indication of uh, terrible diseases that nobody wishes to have. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, supported by this university, like our uh, 
Projektor, Professor Kiesakowska, ein Professor Wilkitschka, der Application Areas in the Computer Science Deep Place, and in post both ways, first to use big data for understanding Europe, science, the brain, but not only the brain, it's our whole uh, uh, medical compartment as much as the nurse are involved, uh, and, and in, in reverse, to understand uh, the web direction. Understanding neuroscience, the brain, how we biologically work mm -hmm. in medical and in uh, electrical terms, uh, electronic terms, uh, uh, to support the process of learning, the process of wisdom. So that came just to my mind when listening to your very valuable and inspiring talk. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we can talk about it while I'm here. Thank you. And a little bit more, because the photos of the year, and we, we work in uh, Europe. Uh, a scientific organization, mm -hmm. and at the occasion of our conference that we are going to have in Valencia, in Spain, beautiful city also, in Poznan, uh, there will be two special issues about that subject. So if anybody, and the supervisors and friends, and, and the people in abroad, that work on related areas, they are welcome to submit. Uh, it's on your Okay, thank you. software so if someone is watching an ad on their computer with the camera on you can track the facial movements and gather all that data to see what the reaction is to the ad. So there's a, companies are finding new 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 ways and new data all the time. So I, I don't see it slowing down. Yeah. yeah it's scary. All right, well, I'm, I'm sure the students are champing at the bit to get out of here, so thank you, thank you so much. Thank you.